for the book signing. My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I'm very pleased to welcome our guests this evening. Tonight, science and fiction will intertwine, or maybe not, as we learn whether the existence of mammoths, woolly Columbian Jefferson, or child star may come into being beyond the realm of imagination. Our first presenter, Thomas Pierce, has written a story collection which Janet Maslin of the New York Times calls ridiculously good and beautifully built, both true. Intersecting at the crossroads of everyday and extraordinary, Pierce's breakout debut, The Hall of Small Mammals, peeks into the strange and intimate worlds of fossil hounds, comedians, hot air balloonists, skeptics, believers, wise children, foolish adults, and maybe even a woolly mammoth or two. Thomas Pierce is an MFA graduate from the University of Virginia and has published stories in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and Oxford American. Our second presenter, Beth Shapiro, is an evolutionary molecular biologist whose career has focused on the analysis of ancient DNA recovered from frozen, mummified, or otherwise preserved animals and plants. A Rhodes Scholar, winner of a MacArthur Genius Grant, and an Oxford University Research Fellow, Shapiro has written about ecology for a number of academic journals, including science and molecular biology and evolution. She also hails from Allentown, for those of you who are regionalists. Her new book, How to Clone a Mammoth, examines the incredible and controversial process of de-extinction, the means through which mammoths, passenger pigeons, dodos, and other extinct species can be resurrected and conserved for future generations. Elizabeth Colbert, author of The Sixth Extinction, writes, bringing a lost species back to life is an exciting prospect and also a scary one. No one is better able to explain the challenges and the potential of the enterprise than Beth Shapiro. How to Clone a Mammoth is an engaging, rigorous, and deeply thoughtful book. We'll start with our first presenter, Thomas Pierce. Hi, I am Thomas Pierce. Nice to see you. Thanks for being here. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you to the library for having me and very glad to be here with Beth. Uh, a little intimidated to be here with Beth, I have to say. Uh, so this is a book of short stories, as, as he just said. And uh, I am, I'm from South Carolina originally. I'm living in Charlottesville, Virginia now. Went to school there a couple of years ago and I'm still living there because it's a great spot. And uh, I was a producer and reporter for NPR for a number of years, and uh, that was my career for five or six years. I wanted to get back into fiction. I love fiction. It's what I've always wanted to do, and I quit my job, <laughs> and uh, for better or worse, I think for, hopefully for better, and uh, started writing more fiction. That was three or four years ago, and uh, or five years ago, even. These stories were all written in a period of time of about three or four years uh, three-ish years, which is a pretty short amount of time, I, I gather, from some other folks in the world of collections of stories for stories to be written. Uh, I'm going to read from two very short pieces from two different stories, and uh, I, I think I, I would be remiss not to read from the mammoth story, uh, given <laughs> our other guest here tonight, so I'm going to do that. Um, I'm gonna, just going to read a short section here. When the story opens, there's a, a mother whose name is Mama. Uh, it's not her given name, but that's, the, uh, that's what her, her relatives call her, Mama. And she's been throwing a party for her uh, niece who's getting married. Her son has failed to appear. He lives in Atlanta. He's, um, he's kind of a ne'er-do-well, but he's also the host of a, of a television program in, in Atlanta. And she's very upset. He's missed this whole ceremony and uh, and that's where we'll, we'll begin. She is on the edge of sleep when she hears the truck in the driveway. The porch lights hum with a new electricity. If the moon could radiate more light, it would. Tommy is home. She wants to sing. She wishes the party wasn't over so everyone could see her son. When she greets him out front, he pulls her into a deep hug. You look thin, she says. How about some coconut shrimp or wedding cake? His eyes are bloodshot, his brown hair ruffled. He's wearing suit pants and a white undershirt. She hasn't seen him in eight months and six days. 
She's already forgiven him, already forgotten how mad she was an hour ago. He pulls her into a short waltz across the asphalt. I promised you a dance, he says. Don't think I forgot. Your uncle asked me if you've fallen in with the wrong sort of people, she says, teasing him. That's code for drugs, in case you're wondering. They stop dancing. Did you set him straight? I wasn't sure what to tell him, she says, eyebrows, eyebrows arched, looking away but smiling. Sometimes she feels like a different person around Tommy, carefree, lighthearted. Well, Ma, I've got a good reason for being late, he says, and pats his truck, which has a back from extinction magnetic decal on its door. Something I need to show you, he says. Pour us both a drink and meet me around back. She pours him some grapefruit juice in a tall Daffy Duck glass. Tommy comes into the house through the back door. She hands him the glass, and he takes a swig, then looks at her, concerned, confused. He pulls a flask out of his pocket, tips it into Daffy Duck. Follow me, he says, and leads her into the backyard, both of them swatting their way through a veil of mosquitoes and moths attacking the overhead floodlight. There, in the freshly mowed grass, Tommy has something hidden under a quilt. It's moving. What I'm about to show you, he says, you can't tell a soul about it. If you did, there would be major trouble, trouble with a capital T. He sips his drink and tugs the quilt away. Mama takes a step back. She's looking at some kind of elephant with hair. Don't worry, she's not dangerous, Tommy says. Bread Island Dwarf Mammoth. The last wild one lived about 10,000 years ago. They're the smallest mammoths that ever existed. Cute, isn't she? The mammoth is waist high with a pelt of dirty blonde fur that hangs in taggle, tangled draggles to the dirt. Its tusks, white and pristine, curve out and up. The forehead is high and knobby and covered in a darker fur. The trunk probes the ground for God knows what and then curls back into itself like a jelly roll. What's a gosh darn Red Island dwarf whatever doing in my yard, Mama asks. Listen, Tommy says, this is very special. Other than the folks at work, you're the first modern human to ever lay eyes on such a creature. Her episode hasn't even aired yet. Go on, you can touch her. She's friendly, practically tame. Her name's Shirley Temple. <laughs> Shirley Temple, Mama asks. You can't name it that. Shirley Temple was Shirley Temple. She points to the dog pen, under which Shirley Temple the Great Dane is buried. <laughs> it's a good name for a dog. The dog had tumors that couldn't be removed. The vet wanted to put her to sleep, but Mama couldn't bear it. One night, she left that pen open by mistake, and three days later, she found the dog curled and cold under the porch. All right, Tommy says, I'm in it to be honorific. Call this one Shirley Temple, too, if you'd like. He puts his hand on the mammoth's tusk. Or maybe we could call her Shirley Temple the third, since, you know, technically the first one was the good ship lollipop Shirley Temple. This one's about as dangerous as the little girl. He runs his hand along Shirley Temple III's back. The mammoth looks up at him with, a, with dark, mysterious eyes. It doesn't seem to knew, know what to do in this new setting. Is it full grown, she asks. That's what they tell me. Isn't she amazing? Mama nods because the mammoth really is a scientific miracle, a true marvel. But then again, it's getting late. She's been awake since 4 a.m., working on final preparations for the reception, and she's already taken her pill. The moonlight shines down on the three of them. They decide to keep Shirley Temple III in the dog pen for the night. And I'll stop there with that story. Uh, things are rough for Shirley. You know, this is, this is in Atlanta where this story takes place. Not exactly the ideal climate. Uh, things don't go perfect for that poor mammoth. So uh, uh, I'm sorry to report. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. Like there, there's this, uh, I mentioned I'm from South Carolina. And not long after I wrote this story, um, maybe right after it was published, there was a little girl in South Carolina, this eight-year-old, and on her playground at school, she enjoyed looking for shark's teeth and whatnot, and she decided that South Carolina needed a state fossil. I gather some states have state fossils. It's, it's a thing. Uh, we have state everything. I mean, state, South Carolina has a state snack. I think it's the boiled peanut. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> state dance is the shag, I, I'm pretty sure. Um, I feel like I should, people know what the shag is. I hope. The shag is a swing-like dance. Uh, so we, they, this girl decided we needed a state fossil, and that would be the woolly mammoth. It would be the, um, co the Colombian mammoth. Um, and so she put this to her, her state representative, and there's, they got some momentum, and things got moving, and the, the House actually passed a bill that would make the, that the state fossil. And then it got to the Senate. Some senators decided, well, if we're going to do that, um, maybe, we should, maybe we should put some extra language on there. What they wanted to do was tack on some language that basically pulling language from the book of Genesis, saying something like, uh, 
on the sixth day, the, the woolly mammoth which was created on the sixth day with the beast of the field or something to that effect. It almost passed. It almost went through. I don't know if you are familiar with this story. Yeah. Uh, it did not. I'm glad, I'm glad to say uh, it went through without that language. Although the lieutenant governor, when they did pass it, said that they should nickname their mammoth Lazarus because they were bringing it back from the dead. So my point is that you know, reality is a strange thing. These, these <laughs> the way we, we make sense of our, our, our world, our existence, the way we, religion and science sometimes, uh, sometimes they, they hit up against it and other, one another and sometimes they create really interesting uh, systems of logic, you know, the way people try to explain the world to themselves, the way they make sense of new information, uh, like this character, Mama, who suddenly has to contend with a mammoth. She's a very religious lady and what to do with this very alive mammoth in her backyard. These are the things that interest me. These are the things that really tie a lot of these stories together. These are stories about people who are confronting something that seems wholly unnatural. They're animals often in some of these stories, but really these are, about, these are stories about people who are dealing with something that seems unnatural, that seems uh, out of place uh, in the way they think about the universe. So with that in mind, I'm going to read a little bit more from another story called The Real Alan Gas. And I'll start from the beginning, so it needs no introduction. He's been living with her for not quite a year when Claire first mentions Alan Gas. I think I need to tell you about something, she says, about someone. Walker turns down the stereo above the fridge and readies himself for whatever comes next. They are in the kitchen formerly her kitchen, now their kitchen. The butter crackles around the edges of the potatoes he is frying in a big cast iron pan. He runs his hand through his dark hair, as if exhausted. If she confesses an affair, what will he do? First, switch off the burner. Second, grab his jacket and go without a word. The third step could involve fast walking, tears, and possibly a stop at the liquor store. Beyond that, it's hard to say. Claire's on the other side of the kitchen island with her laptop open, an old black t-shirt sagging down her left shoulder, a turquoise bra strap exposed. Until now, she's been quietly at work. She no longer takes classes, but when she did, they had titles like Advanced Topics and Subatomic, Sub-Subatomic Forces. Thanks to a graduate fellowship, she spends most days on the top floor of the physics building at the university thinking about a theoretical particle called the daisy. The daisy is a candidate for the smallest particle in the universe but no one has devised a way to observe or prove the existence of one. Doing so would probably require recreating the conditions of the Big Bang, which everyone seems to agree would be a bad idea. <laughs> the wider academic community has not fully embraced Daisy Theory, as it's called. Claire's advisor came up with it, and like him, Claire believes the mysterious particle is forever locked in a curious state of existence and non-existence, sliding back and forth between the two. Daisy Theory has helped put Claire's physics department on the map. I haven't mentioned him until now because she scratches her chin with her chipped electric blue fingernail. I was embarrassed, I guess. Just tell me, he says, wanting this over with quickly. All right, here it is. Okay, I'm kind of married. <laughs> K kind of. <laughs> he doesn't understand. Typically one is or isn't married. He races through the possibilities. She's separated from someone and failed to mention it until now. Or rather, she met and married a mysterious man on the sly, or not a man, but a woman, and what she wants to propose next is an open relationship. No, more likely, this is a new and clever update on the same old fight they have about time and priorities. She's married to her research, and he just needs to get that through his head. No, what I mean, is, what I mean to say is, sometimes at night, when I dream, I dream I have a husband. A dream marriage, he says. Okay. He kills the burner under the pan and scrapes the potatoes onto the plate where, the, where the, uh, already the green beans have gone cold. Tell me what you're thinking, she says. Does this bother you? You're not the man in the dreams. Just so I'm clear, he says, this isn't you telling me that you're cheating on me. I'm not cheating on you, not unless you count dreams as cheating, do you? Walker wonders if this is an elaborate test, if maybe he muttered some other woman's name in his sleep the previous night. Although he sometimes dreams about sex, in the morning the details of his encounters are usually hazy and impressionistic with floating parts that don't connect to a specific face. He doesn't mention this now. A dream marriage, if that's really what this is about, should probably not bother him. He tells her so. 
So it doesn't concern you that I'm in love with someone else in my dreams, she asks. He didn't mention love, he says. Well, I married him, didn't I? Do I know the guy? Have I met him? Please don't tell me it's your advisor. Whenever she talks about needing more time for her research, Walker knows that includes more time alone with her advisor. She reaches across the island for Walker's hand, a gesture that makes him suspect he's about to get more bad news. It's not my advisor, she says. My husband's name is Alan Gass. Alan Gass only exists in her dreams, she explains. He is an ophthalmologist, a tall man with bright blue eyes and a lightly bearded face. His favorite meal in the world is barbecue biscuits. He's allergic to shellfish. Years ago, he played college football, but he's put on a little weight since those days. On Saturdays, he plays golf, but professes to hate what he calls clubhouse culture. He just likes the wind in his hair, the taste of a cold beer on the back nine. Claire has been married to him for almost a decade. Wow, Hawker says, you have incredibly detailed dreams. That's what I'm trying to tell you, she says. They're super realistic. Sometimes I dream that we're just eating dinner together, kind of like this. We tell each other about our day, or we don't talk at all. We've known each other so long, silence is okay at this point, you know? Walker takes a bite of the potatoes. Claire hasn't shut her laptop. You writing out an email over there, he asks, and expects a full assault of U-waves, big gravity, but when she turns the screen, he discovers that she's looking at a website with pictures of celebrities eating messy sandwiches and picking out shampoo at the drugstore. So is Alan Gass better looking than me? Ah, silly duck, she says, a recurring joke about his outturned feet. She turns the laptop and comes around the island. Silly duck with big sexy glasses. She plucks the glasses from his face. Silly duck with snazzy shoes. She taps his black shoes with her socked feet. Silly duck with perfect duck lips. She kisses him. He stands and wraps his arms around her waist. A former high, high school volleyball star, Claire is a few inches taller than Walker, and even more so right now with her blonde hair up and a high messy bun. He doesn't mind her height, but whenever they ride an escalator together, he claims the higher step to see what it's like. Admittedly, her dream is a strange one, so visceral, so coherent, so consistent, but he can see no reason why Alan Gass should come between them. After imagining a real affair, he feels somewhat relieved. It isn't as though she is actually married and actually in love with an actual ophthalmologist. What counts is that the real Claire, the waking Claire, the part of her that matters, wants Walker and only Walker. And that is the case, is it not? She says that is most definitely the case. She kisses him, tucks his hand to her cheek. She is relieved, she says, that he finally knows her secret, a secret she's never told anyone, not even her parents. What a weight off her shoulders. Anything he wants to ask, he can ask. She will hide nothing from him. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. My turn. He said he was intimidated. Imagine having to go after that. <laughs> and being so short that you can't actually see me behind my computer. <laughs> so, whoopsie. I'm going to stand over here. I'll be okay. So you can hear me. Because like nobody can see me otherwise. Right? <laughs> Actually, so, do you want a wireless like, handheld? I can give you or a handheld? Yeah, that would be good. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> can you see me? I'm getting another mic here because I'm too short. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Is this on? Okay, good, excellent. So uh, that's good. What? Sorry? There's heckling. Do you believe that? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, why not? I'm in Pennsylvania, after all. I would expect nothing less, right? Bit of heckling. That's what we use to. Anyway, thank you for coming for spending part of your evening listening to this nonsense that's about to come. Um, I'm, I'm a scientist, which means that I have very little talent. 
especially compared to the previous speaker here. So bear with me, right? Um, I thought that I would begin, because I don't have very much time tonight, to introduce you to a little bit of what I actually do in my lab. And um, one of the many hats I wear is I'm a National Geographic Explorer. So I have some stuff that was shot recently, and I'm going to play it and hope that the computer picks up the sound here, just to give you an idea of where I'm coming from here. Oh. No. What we just found, you can see, is one, two, three, four pieces of mammoth bone here. This is part mammoth of the bone. So you can see how big this is. And the neat thing about this is that these are the small pieces, which means that the stuff is washed downstream. See, these pieces are actually still frozen in the permafrost. We can't get them out at all, which means they're going to be really well preserved. Just heard that big splash of water back there. That means another hole broken through. Here comes the water. We better get out of here. <laughs> All right. So that ending is kind of silly. But in my defense, that water is really disgusting. So that was, um, that was an active gold mine, a placer mine, near Dawson City in the Yukon Territory in Canada. What they do there is when the snow melts, the water is collected in these big holding ponds, and then they pump it up, and where the, the permafrost, the frozen soil, is melting because it's warm, they just use that water to wash the melted stuff away, and you get just to this frozen layer behind it. Stop spraying it down for a bit, let the sun warm the next couple of inches, and then spray those down. The goal of the gold miners is to get rid of all of that dirt and expose the gold-bearing gravels beneath. But as they're doing that, all sorts of bones like this, and also the remnants of plants and sometimes mummified animals and stuff come washing out. And that water is made of just that frozen dirt and water and grossness that's been there for up to the last 700,000 years. So trust me, you don't want that to be washed over your head when you're standing there, right? It's pretty disgusting. So my research, my actual research, is, uh, is, is to try to... I use DNA sequences extracted from these bones, the types of things that we find here, and we correlate the amount of genetic diversity that we can see in these DNA sequences sampled through time with how big populations were at any one time point. The goal of my research is to try to understand how species and populations and ecosystems changed in response to really rapid warming period that happened in the past. In particular, the really rapid warming that happened after the last ice age, about 20,000 to 15,000 years ago, as the world warmed up a whopping eight degrees Celsius or so pretty quickly, pretty speedily. Our aim is to try to figure out why some species went extinct and others didn't, and to use this information to help make better decisions about how to use the limited resources we have today to conserve species. Of course, that has just led to a whole bunch of people calling me and asking me how close we are to cloning a mammoth, which is how we get to this particular place we are. So, the field that, uh, that cloning a mammoth has become is, is known as de-extinction, right? It's a terrible word. I admit it's a terrible word. But it, I didn't choose it, and it seems to have stuck. So we're there, right? Everybody's probably familiar, at least a little bit, with de-extinction, because we were there the last time it happened. <laughs> And we know that it went just swimmingly, no problems whatsoever. <laughs> Life did not find a way, as, as it were. Um, so th what they did here, of course, was they looked deep into mosquitoes preserved in amber. And they extracted DNA from those mosquitoes preserved in amber. Well, guess what? There's no DNA in mosquitoes preserved in amber. In fact, there is no DNA in insects preserved in copal, which is the precursor to amber. That can be just a couple of decades old. A few years ago, there was a lab at University College London that went back into the back rooms of the Museum of Natural History in London and picked out a whole bunch of amber and copal. That was from like the 1950s and 1960s. And some of them had bugs in them, and some of them didn't have bugs in them. Then they extracted DNA and tried to amplify insect DNA from them. And they did get insect DNA from some of these pieces of amber. Unfortunately, there was no correlation between having bugs in it and having bug DNA, right? Turns out that DNA is pretty much everywhere, and insect DNA, because insects are pretty much everywhere, is also pretty much everywhere. So, there is no DNA preserved in amber. 
But they're all our sorts of dinosaur bones, right? So we could just go out and pick up dinosaur bones and we could extract DNA from those, right? Well, turns out, no. <laughs> no, because dinosaur bones are rocks. And once there are rocks, there is no DNA. We are not going to ever be able to clone a dinosaur. Sorry. <laughs> of course, we know that there are very well-preserved mammoths, and because since mammoths are the second best thing to dinosaurs, at least that's the feeling that I get listening to people ask me questions, we could just go into Siberia and find these incredibly well-preserved beings and clone them, right? That's what we're going to do. So this is how it works. Plan A, clone a mammoth. Are we going to be able to clone a mammoth? It turns out that cloning is actually a very specific scientific technique. It's known in science words as somatic cell nuclear transfer. Somatic cell nuclear transfer is kind of straightforward. Mm -hmm. I say that a little bit. Basically, we have two types of cells in our body. We have germ cells, which are sperm and eggs, and we have somatic cells, which is everything else. Hair cells, skin cells, heart cells, blood cells, all those cells are somatic cells. The trick to somatic cell nuclear transfer is to convince a cell that is not a sperm or an egg that it can become every type of cell in the body rather than just the type of cell that it already has the instructions to be. You've probably all heard of Dolly the sheep, right? Dolly was the first example of successful somatic cell nuclear transfer. So they took somatic cells, they were mammary cells in the case of Dolly, put them in a dish and stressed them out, starved them of nutrients. At the same time, they took an egg cell from a different breed of sheep right here, and they sucked the nuclear material out of it. This is the bit that would have gone on to be fertilized by a sperm and then go on to develop to become an entire sheep. But they sucked that on out of there. And then they zap this thing with electricity, the cell membrane opens up and this kind of dumps in here. And then somehow, when you zap it with electricity, the proteins in that egg cell can trick that somatic cell to revert, to revert into some primordial state where just like a newly fertilized egg and sperm, zygote, newly fertilized cell coming together, it could go on to become every single type of cell in a body. And it did, it grew up after being implanted or or surrogacy, surrogate pregnancy here with this particular sheep here. And you had Dolly who was born, was a genetic clone of this guy, but not the egg donor and not the surrogate mom. Straightforward, right? So how do we do it with a mammoth? Well, we find a particularly well-preserved mammoth. We take a somatic cell out of that mammoth and we stress it out in the lab. We insert it into an egg cell. It does its kind of magical little thing there, right? And then all, we can plant it in an elephant and you know, it grows up in the body and we release it into the atom. But perfect, right? Really easy. Absolutely, this is how it works. <laughs> Whew. Now here we have our first problem. So we find some really well-preserved bones out there in the, in the Arctic. We find, this is a horse bone here that's, um, we know it's about 300,000 years old. We pulled it up from Dawson City near the Yukon. It looks brilliant. It looks just like a, a regular fresh horse lower jaw. We have really well-preserved mammoths. A couple summers ago, you might have seen on the news, they found this mammoth in the, near New Siberian Islands, and it was associated with a, a liquidy red substance that they said might be blood. It wasn't blood, but they said it might be blood at the time. Yeah? Well, these things are incredibly well preserved, but none of them are going to have a living cell in them. When an organism dies, the DNA and the cells that the, contain that DNA start to decay right away. First, by the action of little enzymes that are already in the body. You have all these microbes in your gut. If you're a, a mammoth mummy, the gut swells and bursts after you die. All those microbes go everywhere and start chopping up the DNA. The bone gets buried in the soil. The soil is full of microbes that have all sorts of needs to eat stuff, right? So they chop up that DNA. The sun breaks down DNA. UV light freeze thaw from water, breaks down DNA, UV light. It turns out that after a very short amount of time, even over the course of days, there are no longer going to be any intact cells and no living cells mean we can't clone a mammoth. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. So in the news last week, there was, a, there was a story that got a lot of attention. It was that there was a lab in Sweden that had successfully sequenced and assembled the complete genome of two mammoths, right? So now we have a very long list of A's, C's, G's, and T's that make up the genome sequence of a mammoth. Whoops, 
Get ahead of myself here. Very long list of ACs, Gs and Ts, go back. Anyway, what that would be, this genome sequence here, is a blueprint, right? A blueprint for piecing together a mammoth. This sequence contains the genes that make the proteins that make a mammoth look and act the way they make, the way they do. So all we have to do is assemble this AC, G, and T blueprint thing in lab somewhere, really long strand of ACs, Gs, and Ts, and stick those into a chromosome, and stick those chromosomes into a cell, and then the cell can go in the egg, and then the mammoth, and then the all the way around. But that's going to happen, right? Right. Absolutely going to happen. Well, maybe it's not going to happen. So it turns out that just because they say they have a complete genome sequence doesn't mean they actually have a complete genome sequence. And uh, there are two reasons that it's very hard to assemble a complete genome from a mammoth. And I'm going to tell you really quickly what they are. The first is that, like I just told you, the sequences, because they're being broken down by microbes and by solar radiation and by all sorts of stuff bombarding the cells, they're really tiny and they have lots of damage on them. So they're very hard to figure out what's there. So if you imagine that modern DNA looks like lovely long party streamers, ancient DNA is more like confetti. But I couldn't really find the kind of confetti in a picture on, on the internet that, uh, of what it really looks like. If you could imagine that not this day, but maybe the next day in the parade where they've been swept into the gutter and maybe it rained overnight, Maybe there were mammoths in the parade and a flock of passenger pigeons overhead. It's really bad, right? It's really terrible. The other problem is that uh, the, the DNA that we extract from a mammoth bone contains some mammoth DNA, but it also contains a whole lot of other crap, right? So if I were to sequence a bit of DNA from my own hair or my own cheek, extract DNA and sequence everything I got out, nearly all, oops, all of what I would get out of there would be my own DNA, nearly all of it here. That's because I'm still alive. My DNA is in good condition. There's not much bacteria in my hair, I hope, right? <laughs> Well, about a decade ago, I was involved with the first group to do that same thing, extract DNA from a bit of a mammoth bone, and then sequence every bit of DNA that we get out of that mammoth bone. And we made a plot just like this for that mammoth bone. It was about a 30,000-year-old mammoth bone from Siberia. And we got about half, about half the DNA we extracted was mammoth DNA. The other bit was um, environmental microbial stuff, bacteria, unidentified stuff. This is probably just more soil bacteria because there's so much of it that we don't have a lot of sequences to recognize. And so it's hard to know what we get sometimes. A little bit of contamination. There's always contamination in our labs even though we, we do a lot of stuff. And we were pretty bummed. We were like, geez, we're never going to be able to sequence a complete genome if only half of what we get is really mammoth DNA. It turns out that this was actually a really good sample and that most of the samples that we have have less than 5% mammoth DNA in them. In fact, you may have seen the Neanderthal genome that was sequenced and assembled recently. That was uh, assembled using DNA extracted from three or four different bones. All of those had fewer, fewer than 1% of the DNA that they got out, less than 1% was Neanderthal DNA. The rest was, was soil microbial DNA that had to be thrown out. So imagine that you have your disgusting bit of crumbly old uh, confetti, but really what you actually want are just the purple pieces, right? So how, how do we go about finding that? How do we go about piece, p pulling the mammoth stuff out of that big soup of disgusting broken nonsense that we don't really want? Well, fortunately, we do have complete genome sequences from several different living species. So if we want to sequence and assemble a mammoth genome, we can use the genome sequence of an Asian elephant as a scaffold onto which to map these broken pieces of DNA. And if we want to assemble the Neanderthal genome, we have the human genome that we can use as a scaffold. So we take our broken, nasty bits of DNA and we just figure out where they go along the sequences of the living mammoth, right? This is a little bit of a problem. As you see, there are still some holes in here. All the places where a mammoth is particularly different from an elephant will be places that we don't really have a good map. And probably what's going to happen in many of these places is we will just think that that's just another bit of soil DNA and we'll throw it out. So we might miss some of the most important bits, those bits where the mammoth actually is particularly different from the elephant if we're assembling a genome in this way. So if plan B, sequencing a genome, is the way we're going to do it, we're kind of stuck on the first step. And guess what? We can't sequence the genome of a mammoth. 
but there is another way. And this is, this is the way that, that uh, people really are talking about bringing, bringing extinct species or at least extinct traits back to life. And that is to use genome engineering technology, kind of cutting edge, really awesome science to be able to change the genome of an elephant so that it looks more like the genome of a mammoth. It works in a kind of simple way. If you can imagine taking a DNA strand and basically cutting part out of it that you don't want and pasting back in part of it that you do want. So we now have genome sequences from mammoths and Asian elephants, and we can begin to look at these genomes and figure out where they're particularly different from each other and come up with a catalog of places in that genome that we might not swap out the elephant version for the mammoth version. So imagine we had a little machine that we could program to go at a particular place in the genome and find a gene that we want to swap out and grab a hold of it. And we could send this little machine into the genome with a little package, and that package would be a short strand of synthesized mammoth DNA, the bit we want to swap into that genome when we get rid of, cut out, the elephant version. And then that little machine with its little package could go around the genome and grab onto that right place, chop out the elephant version of the gene, and stick the mammoth version in its place. That would be an incredibly powerful way to turn an elephant into a mammoth. Well, it turns out we have that machine. And it's not a machine. It's not something that we've made. It's actually a naturally occurring enzyme, a protein complex, that comes from bacteria. This is a, an, an enzyme called CRISPR-Cas9. And you might have heard it's been in the news a lot recently because it's incredibly powerful and pretty contentious at this point as well because it's so powerful. Well, CRISPR-Cas9, that's this molecule here, you can pretend that that's the machine, it can search for a particular place in the genome, say this red bit is the elephant DNA, and here's the part we want to change, and then we can send in this little piece of synthesized mammoth DNA, it finds that part of the genome, and it grabs a hold of the part of the genome that it wants to, wants to, to change, and it cuts it in half. Now, your cells don't like it when the DNA in them is broken, and so your cells have evolved a couple of mechanisms to fix those breaks. This technology would then just take advantage of the cell's own mechanism for fixing damage that might accidentally be caused in nature, but instead of just fixing it normally, it slots in the mammoth version of that gene instead, so you end up with an elephant that is just a little bit mammoth, right? <laughs> so what do we change? What do we change? We know that mammoths and Asian elephants are about 99% similar to each other at the genome level already. They've been evolving separately for somewhere around six million years. And so we've started now to make a list of all the things that have changed between them. One of the first genes that was identified is a red blood cell gene, hemoglobin. This was work that was done a couple years ago um, in Kevin Campbell's lab in Manitoba. And they found that Woolly mammoth version of this particular gene was different at only three places from the Asian elephant version. So they made both of these versions and then they did an experiment to see what the difference between them really was. What, what, what was different about the protein that looked like this versus the protein that looked like this? And they found that the woolly mammoth version is much better than the elephant version at carrying oxygen around the body, the normal job of hemoglobin, when it's cold. So there you go, there's one particularly useful thing that you might want to change if you want to make a tropically adapted elephant capable of living somewhere cold, like where mammoths live. So what else would we change? Well, there are lots of things we might want to change. We might want to think about lots of things to make elephants more adapted to living in the cold or to eat a mammoth diet or to be able to fight the types of diseases that mammoths would have to, would have to deal with. And there actually is a lab at Harvard led by George Church that have been working on this. And they've made 14 changes so far. They've changed 14 genes, swapped out the elephant version for the mammoth version of these genes and successfully created a 0.001% mammoth in a dish, in a cell, which is, of course, a far cry from creating an actual mammoth. But it does mean that we now have the genome sequence that we can use to come up with the list of genes we want to change. We also have the genome engineering technology, this CRISPR-Cas9 stuff that we could use to make those changes. And at that point, what we would have is a living cell, a living elephant cell that is somehow a little bit mammoth-like. And then we could just go ahead and use somatic cell nuclear transfer and clone an elephant, right? 
And then we have to go on to this next bit. The next bit I like to call phase two, right? And when you hear about de-extinction in the lab, in the news, you often don't hear about phase two. You hear about phase one and how close we're getting and how that definitely means we're about to clone a mammoth. Well, phase two is probably going to be as hard or possibly harder than phase one. So thinking about it from the beginning, the first thing you have to do is find an appropriate surrogate host, right? Now, in many cases, if the living, closest living relative of the extinct thing is actually very closely related to it, this might not be a problem. But the more evolutionary distance, the more time has passed since the closest living relative shared an ancestor with the mammoth, the harder this is going to be. Moas, for example, an extinct giant New Zealand bird, their closest living relatives diverged from them by more than 35 million years. There might not be any way to make an egg that could contain a moa. There also might be some physical constraints. You know, size differences between living and extinct things can lead to some problems. A good example of that would be uh, the stellar sea cow here. This is a giant um, animal that used to live off the coast of California around the Aleutians and the Commander Islands. Went extinct about 200 years ago because people like to eat them. They could feed a lot of people. The closest living relative to that guy is dugong. Um, if you just follow ratios, regular ratios, the size of a, of a newborn dugong to the, to the mama dugong means that the size of a, a newborn stellar sea cow would be bigger than a dugong. Yeah, that's probably not going to work. Yep. So physical constraints. We also know now that we're, we're much more than just the sum of our genomes, that we're actually the product of our genome sequences and the environments in which we live, which begins prenatally, and we're starting to learn more and more about this. How will an elephant with a few mammoth genes be affected by developing within an elephant and, and where he'll be subjected to her diet and her hormones and, and her lifestyle, her stress, her emotions? After that mammoth is born, it will continue to be raised by a female elephant and live in an elephant society and eat the kinds of things that elephants eat in captivity. All of these things are going to affect the way that animal looks and acts. And is it, in fact, going to override any of the changes that we attempt to make at the genetic level if the interacting environment is so different, so different? And speaking of captivity, there are also ethical considerations to any of these. And uh, I know I'm kind of coming to this toward the end of this, and, and I, sh I don't mean to minimize the ethical challenges here, but I do want to point out at this point that we know very little about how to meet the physical and psychological needs of elephants in captivity. Elephants often fail to reproduce in captivity. They have a lot of diseases. They don't often, um, if they do have babies, they sometimes injure them or even kill them. I think that unless we learn how to effectively treat elephants in captivity. They shouldn't be in captivity at all, much less used in this kind of crazy de-extinction stuff, right? And lastly, um, obviously it would be remiss of me not to point out that the world has changed a lot since many of these species went extinct. And unless there actually is a place that we could put them, it's very difficult to consider why we might bring them back. This right here is the range of the passenger pigeon. You can imagine that all of those lights did not exist 200 years ago, 150 years ago, when the passenger pigeons flocked in the billions. Where would they go if we brought them back? So de-extinction, can we? We can't yet, right? And should we? I mean, this is really the hardest question. And as someone who's written a book about it, I clearly should have a very solid opinion about it, and I do. I don't know. You know, there are a lot of different species that have been proposed for de-extinction. The heath hen that used to live in Martha's Vineyard, mammoths, this guy, the, this is the stellar sea cow, thylacine, passenger pigeon, gastric brooding frogs, bucardos, all kinds of things have been proposed. But I think before, and, and obviously there are different technical challenges and ethical considerations and ecological challenges with any of these, and the biggest challenges are going to be different for each of those. And I do think that the most important thing for us to think about at this point, if we really are going to bring these guys back, is why. Why do we want to bring back a species that's been dead for a long time? And just to come back to the mammoth for the end, although I did say that there are too many technical challenges and we can't do it, and the ethical considerations are so great that we shouldn't do it, now I'm going to tell you why actually we, we should, right? So I have two reasons, two compelling reasons that I think mammoths should be brought back. One is ecological. 
So there's this place in northeastern Siberia called Pleistocene Park. It's right here outside of Chersky. There's a guy, a Russian scientist called Sergei Zimov, who's been buying up land around here in preparation for mammoths and other Ice Age beasts to come back. And so far, he's got bison from Canada, horses, and about five different species of deer in Pleistocene Park, and he's been doing some experiments with them. So he has let these, these herbivores graze in some parts of Pleistocene Park and not in other parts. And you see that there are differences between these two areas. Here where they're not grazing, there's a lot of grass, but there's only really one species, and it's slow growing, and it can't really sustain any grazing herbivores. Over here, you can't really see it, but there's lots of different species of grass. And you notice there is still a bunch of green here. That's important because this is really early spring. The snow is just melted and the grass really hasn't had time to come back. That means that just because they were there by digging up the soil and recycling nutrients and distributing seeds, these animals have created their own habitat. They've made the habitat they live to survive. They need to survive. And Sergei argues that if we could bring back mammoths, a bigger, keystone herbivore, that they, like elephants, who play a very important role in maintaining their habitat, can hasten the return of this really rich steppe tundra, providing a habitat for the species that live in Siberia today, but are on the verge of extinction because there's not enough food for them to eat to be able to survive. My second reason is more sentimental. So I've been arguing recently that we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't bring extinct species back to life. But instead, what we should be doing is using this same technology to actually save species that are endangered today. Few of us can imagine a world without elephants. But Asian elephants are endangered. Their habitat is declining. We're, have trouble, we're having trouble keeping them from being poached. What if we could use this technology not to create a mammoth, but to make an elephant that's capable of living places that mammoths once lived, like temperate climates in North America or Europe, or Arctic climates like Pleistocene Park. What if we could use this technology not to bring back mammoths, but to save elephants? And this technology, this is the reason, and similar reasons in protecting species and populations that are alive today, but in danger of going extinct, where I see the most powerful use of this technology to be. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks to Thomas and to Beth for those terrific presentations. So when I booked this, I thought, mammoth story, mammoth de-extinction, there's lots to talk about here. So who would like to start us off? <laughs> Gentlemen in the middle, please wait for the microphone, one, two, three, four, rows back. It's coming from your right. I can be loud. Yeah, but we want to get it on the podcast. Okay. Um, so in plan C of cloning the mammoth or engineering the mammoth, you said all you have to do is figure out those bits of DNA that are mammoth-like and insert them into the elephant genome. But in plan B, you said you couldn't tell which bits were mammoth-like to know which ones to put them in. Right. So how do you do that? Well, we can tell some of it, right? So we, we can sequence. Um, we have been able to generate most of the genome. The, the bits that we don't no, are obviously going to be a problem. And if the key and crucial things are in those bits, then, uh, then we're screwed, yeah. But, but, there's tons of data that we have, and we can look, for example, at all of the gene sequences, and the genes are pretty conserved, so we can, we can compare, we can start with those, is what I'm saying. We can come with a list of where we know that the protein sequences are different between elephants and mammoths, and we can start with them, like they did with the, uh, with the 14 genes that they've already managed to change, and with some of them that we do see that there are compelling differences. So they, they found one gene that actually made different amounts of hair grow, and they have another, yeah, you could have that gene too, but probably you don't want mammoth hair. <laughs> it would be weird, yeah. <laughs> another question. Thank you. 
their hand. Uh, <laughs> right behind you, Tracy. Great presentations all around, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, question is, um, are you concerned at all with what could go wrong like three generations down the line? Say you get it right and it seems that everything works fine. Um, as generations go by, there is some type of pre- uh, uh, there, there's some type of predilection to um, get a disease that wasn't around a few generations before. How would you deal with that? Yeah, um, it's absolutely true that there is no way that we can predict every consequence of introducing a new species into a habitat or bringing some trait back to life. The same is true when we continue to use the much more slow technology of genome engineering, of breeding, that we've been using since we first domesticated dogs 30,000 years ago. Now, we've been doing this for a long time, and there's always a chance. There's always a chance that something's going to go wrong. Um, the reason that I think that it might be worth, in many cases, taking the risk that something bad happens is that we are facing a massive extinction event. There is a crisis going on right now, and it's absolutely true that what we're doing right now is not solving the problem. And what we're doing right now is sitting around waiting, using traditional technology, maybe buying up some land and hoping stuff fixes itself. I think that it's time that we actually get in there, get our hands dirty, and actually try to make a difference. This is a risky technology, absolutely. But I think saving diversity that we have on the planet today is worth the risk. Maybe we can take a step back from this specific topic and ask what, both, what brought each of you to this area of interest? You want to go first? Uh, sure. Uh, meaning in this case, probably the, the mammoth for me, maybe. Could right? be the mammoth <laughs> story, but Stories, fiction in, yeah. in particular is a means of expression. Yeah. It's so funny, you know, I never imagined, like, when I was writing that story about the mammoth that I'd end up on the stage with someone like that. Like, not my, you know, that's not, like, that's not something you even, like, conceive of when you're writing a fiction piece, so it's Well, I read, I read the, the part about the scientist. You kind of brush that off. Yeah, you're exactly. Like, I they keep said, it a secret. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even from me. Even from me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, avoid that at all costs. Um, <laughs> because it's not possible. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. That's not my concern, though, of course. As a fiction writer, anything is possible in, in, in my world. So, you know, I, well, with fiction, I, I mean, I wrote, I've been writing fiction for a long, a long time since I was a small, a wee child. And uh, it's something I've always wanted to, to do. So that's kind of a, a general answer. With the mammoth, you know, we were just talking before we came out here. People have asked me how, how I came to write a story about a mammoth, and I'm not exactly sure. I, ended up, I tried to write a story about a mother and a son, and then the mammoth is, you know, the title of my talk would be Mammoth is Metaphor or something. That could be like the, that'd be my contribution <laughs> to this, I guess. The mammoth is, is something other than, than mammoth, I think, in, in, in my story. But I will say that when I was in the fifth grade, I did a very, very groundbreaking project on the woolly mammoth with my tri uh, tribe construction cardboard folding, you know, these like very large projects in which I did a very large color pencil drawing of a woolly mammoth. Uh, so that's my... <laughs> Do you still have it? I don't still have it, which is a huge <laughs> unfortunate thing. Uh, yeah. uh, but I've always, I've, I, was that, I was that child, I think, in your presentation. It was like crying. That was me in the... That was me at a... <laughs> that was me, yeah. Today? Or? Yeah, today. <laughs> Just now, yeah, just, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> uh, for me, I guess, writing this book, I, I said in the beginning, but I, I was a little bit um, uh, probably confusing at first. Uh, my research is really nothing to do, my actual research has nothing to do with bringing extinct species back to life. And uh, we, we do a lot of work where we're looking at the, how these species evolved over time, asking questions about why mammoths are different from Asian elephants or why passenger pigeons might have flocked in the billions and really trying to understand the natural history of species that have gone extinct or species that are still alive so that we can um, try to use what we learned from the past to help deal with the present crisis that we're in. And we publish this stuff in, in nice journals. We get a lot of attention. The press calls. My mom cares. You know, people call and really want to know what's going on. And I get really excited. Oh, I'm going to get to talk about what we found. Oh, I'm going to get to make a difference. And in, invariably, <laughs> the question is, so does this mean we're closer to cloning a mammoth? And honestly, I got really sick of answering that question. <laughs> so I decided to write the book. Yeah. yeah. You just point to that and you're done. <laughs> and you can go on with your research. <laughs> 
Another question, please. Yes, gentleman in blue here. Speaking of uh, possibly extinct species, has anyone tried to clone a human being? So the, the reason that the CRISPRs have been in the news recently, this, this little machine to edit the DNA, is that there's a Chinese lab that a few weeks ago um, used that to edit human embryos. They didn't go so far as to, to make them into humans. Uh, this technology is being developed to cure human genetic diseases. I mean, it's not being developed to bring extinct species back to life or to recreate people. And a bunch of scientists, including many of the scientists who are currently arguing over patent rights for CRISPR, and I'm not among them. This is a powerful technology. There are a lot of people fighting over the patent rights. And uh, they got together and wrote an editorial in the New York Times about how they think we should not be using it because it is so scary. It's such a powerful new technology. It will be possible to do crazy stuff. Keep in mind, though, that just because something is a clone of something else doesn't mean that it's going to be identical to that thing, right? Because, like I said before, we're, we're a combination of the genotype that we have and the environment that we're in. There are lots of scary applications of CRISPRs that can be discussed about, you know, editing humans and doing horrible things. But, uh, in fact, I was, I was having an interview with the guys from Radiolab a while ago, and they asked me what the scariest thing I could think of. And I had a moment of panic, and I thought, I don't want to say that on the radio. <laughs> so you're right. No one's done it yet, but who knows? Yeah, I think it's probably inevitable. <laughs> Another question. Uh, yeah, there's a lady on the aisle here. And then there's a gentleman behind her. Yeah, quest another question for Beth. Um, and what's the question you wish people would ask you about your research? <laughs> <laughs> now you're putting me on the spot. I don't know. Just anything about whatever the most recent thing that we actually discovered would be. You know, uh, we do. We've done a lot of work with. Um, trying to figure out what caused the megafaunal mass extinction at the end of the Pleistocene. So after the Ice Age, the planet warmed up a lot, and we lost mammoths and mastodons and uh, giant beavers, five-foot-tall beavers, and uh, one of the species of horse, actually both species of horse, went extinct in North America. There were huge mass extinctions of megafauna, big animals. And the two, mo the two most often cited reasons, explanations for this extinction are that they really hated the Ice Age, that it was too cold at the peak of the Ice Age and they went extinct, or that people hunted them to death, right? What we found is that bison, horses, and mammoths, the three most abundant big animals in North America, actually started to decline around 40,000 years ago. So, and that was 20,000 years before the peak of the Ice Age and a good 25 or 30,000 years before there were large numbers of humans in North America. So it seems that humans, at least, are off the hook for the beginning of the decline of these things. I'm not quite willing to let us off the hook for the actual extinction event, but by the time humans arrived, these species seem to have already been in serious trouble. We don't know why they started to decline so long before the Ice Age. And that's kind of what we're working on now, just looking at how um, the, the population dynamics are, are responding to climate change or precipitation or changes in the vegetation community. This is the kind of stuff I actually do. It's much less interesting than cloning mammoths. <laughs> I want to know, okay, I know that they had cloned a sheep with a dolly, like the Pope and like the first clone sheep they had cloned. And the thing about religions, because you go have a lot of religious groups talk about, you know, you can't do these things. But um, the cloning thing, I mean, it sounds like a good idea, but it it sounds like a bad idea. Like, yeah, so. yeah, remember, again, um, like, like I just said, you know, just because something is an identical clone or identical genome sequence doesn't mean it's the same thing. Identical twins are clones. They have identical genome sequences. But we know that as identical twins grow, as they get older, um, they diverge from how they look, how they act. They're certainly not the same person. And sometimes by the time they're in their old age, you can't even tell they're related anymore. They look so different from each other. And this is because of different diets, different activities, different exposures, different stresses. 
really, we're much more than the sequence of genes, and that's all we're doing when we're creating a clone. There's much more to a being than just the A's, C's, G's, and T's. Gentleman in the orange here. And then we'll head all the way back. So in, in the United States today, we, we already consume a lot of genetically modified organisms, uh, some of which are very inefficient, say cows. We consume a lot of water. Um, do you think there's any future in cloning animals that were extinct before being more efficient as a food source for us as a people? I don't know. I mean, I think that if we're, we want to use efficient food sources, we should probably not eat meat and, uh, you know, we should be careful. I'm, I'm not a vegetarian, but I know that if we want to be more efficient in using our resources, we probably should be vegetarians. Um, maybe there are ways that we could look back into the past for genes that could, that could help us out in different ways. And that's kind of where, where, what I'm thinking about when I'm talking about using uh, traits or genes or, or phenotypes that have evolved, that used to exist, that have gone extinct, and using them to kind of allow living species to adapt more quickly or to become potentially more efficient. We don't know any of those gene sequences right now, and it's going to be a long time before we can identify specifically something that will do a specific job. We don't know that yet. We're very early in, this, in understanding what genome sequences are. We've got a lot of genome sequences. A lot of genome sequences have been published, but it's pretty much like being handed a whole bunch of phone books for big cities that have had all the names removed, right? They're kind of useless. Right? It's going to take a long time for us to figure out what all those names are so that we can actually start doing something with these data. And gentlemen, all the way in back there. Uh, what are the one or two um, most interesting possibilities that you foresee happening uh, in your field in your lifetime? So I think, I mean, sticking with this particular theme, that being able to use this technology to help save living species is something that we will be able to do. One project that is underway right now has to do with black-footed ferrets. These are animals that live across the Central Plains that nearly went extinct. Um, recently because of extermination programs and then because of hunting and things like that. Um, and now they are all almost genetically identical to each other and there is a disease that's killing them that's gotten out into their population. But there are black-footed ferrets that have been sampled prior to this population bottleneck, the big crash that made them lose all their diversity. And they're preserved in a place in San Diego called the Frozen Zoo. This is the brainchild of a really wonderful guy called Oliver Ryder, who was convinced several decades ago that someday there would be a way to save species and bring species back from extinction. So he has this enormous collection of frozen tissue samples, including black-footed ferrets from before this crash. There are also black-footed ferrets in museum collections. So. The goal is to go into these past populations of black-footed ferrets and look specifically at the major histamine complex, the disease kind of fighting part of the genome, and to take major histamine complex alleles, you know, immunity alleles that are extinct, that are gone from that population, and then swap out some of the same ones that everybody has that's not working for them to fight these diseases with some of these that just don't exist anymore by chance, and hopefully then give this population a fighting chance against the disease that's killing them. I think that is a really tremendously powerful tool, and I think that really we are moving in that direction. And it's slow because it's hard to know what genes to change, and it's slow because of all the technical challenges associated with doing this stuff. But I think it's going to happen. Before we sign off, maybe you could each tell us, and this might rope both of you in, um, I, I assume what you do gives you great pleasure, but I wonder if you could talk about what you see the ultimate goal of it for you being your contribution and your contribution to your respective fields. I think I've probably said enough, actually, and, and I can just write on that particular answer. And I would really like to see that, that that's kind of the development of the ability to use this technology to save species that are alive today or communities that are alive today to reinvigorate those. That's what I hope, hope to be able to do. My goal is not nearly so lofty. I'd say. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. I, my, mine are simple, I think, is to keep, to keep writing and to to keep entertaining people. That's my main, that's my main. entertainment with a, um, uh, with a nugget of something that challenges the way you think about the world or the way you, you know, what you believe about the world, kind of a sneak attack. That's my, that's my ultimate goal, I suppose. 
to keep writing books. I, I'm working on another one now, so that's my... <laughs> I would love to be saving species. That sounds, Me too. This is a lot more admirable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we've got a lot to shoot for. Please join me in thanking Thomas Pierce and Beth Shapiro.